Live. I am ready to go live. Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. I am live, I believe, I believe, here on StreamYard for Benchley Night. It's been a long time. I barely remember how to do these, ladies and gentlemen. I barely remember how to do these, but someone is here because it says there is one person watching. And if there is one person watching, then it's all worth it. Hi, Terry Hudson. How are you? Hi, Nat Hunter. Nat Hunter says, yo. Us, us, us hunters, we're very street. We're very street. Carol Fulkerson, she's checking in from Missouri. How are the sheep doing, Carol? All right. Oh, it is so much fun to be able to do these, and I thank you all so much. I thank you all so much. Um, you know, America, <laughs> we're lurching toward fascism in a alarming way. So I, I am with those of you who are all of a sudden big fans of Liz Cheney. Things I never expected to be in my lifetime, ladies and gentlemen. A big, big fan of Liz Cheney. God bless Liz Cheney. Anyway, let's do some shout outs because today's beneficiary is Planned Parenthood of Northern New England. See, something probably Liz Cheney and I wouldn't particularly agree on, but peaceful transfer of power. That trumps everything. Trumps. <laughs> that trumps everything. Anyway, so thank you, who uh, all of you who donated to um, Planned Parenthood of Northern uh, New England, either directly or through the Liberal Snowplow and Do Gooder Fund. We raised over two hundred and ten bucks, and I am amazed that I can just read these bits of humor and raise anything at all for worthwhile causes. So a special shout out from the unidentified unglet in the can to Miss Susan Bluestein, ah! to Mr. Rick Gavatsky in Bellows Falls, continually in Facebook jail, ah! to Ms. Catherine Fisher, and thank you for ordering my new book of sketches, Catherine. I appreciate that greatly. Ladies and gentlemen, my new book of sketches will be available in starting in mid-August. You should definitely get a copy. Oh my, yes. Thank you so much. <coughs> Ms. Sarah Ovenden down there in Guilford, Vermont with her cannon firing neighbors. Thank you, Sarah. <coughs> Mr. John Wilhelm out there in Omaha, Nebraska, where they have more lobster roll restaurants per capita than they do in Rockland, Maine. It is astonishing, ladies and gentlemen, the amount of lobster rolls that the Omahaians are desiring to consume. And Mr. Wilhelm is there in the thick of it, ladies and gentlemen, reporting to us just how they are. Just how they are. Thank you, Mr. Wilhelm. <coughs> Out there in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I have not heard, and I don't really know what's going on in Cincinnati this week. Uh, the Bengals, not that season hasn't started yet. The subway is still the only subway that ever got built, never got put into operation. The Union Station is still the coolest Art Deco structure in the United States. But anyway, keeping a close watch on what is going on out there in Cincinnati, Ohio, Mr. J.T. Mayor. <coughs> she has been visiting. She has been visiting the Frank Lloyd Wright Houses of America, ladies and gentlemen. And those of us who are Facebook friends are mesmerized. We are mesmerized with her encyclopedic knowledge of Frank Lloyd Wright Houses and her desire to see them all. Well, we thank Miss Terry Hudson. Thank you, Terry. <coughs> Ms. Martha Rowley, Ms. Martha Rowley of Saxons River, Vermont. Saxons River, Vermont was supposed to have been cut off from Bellows Falls, Vermont, uh, a couple of weeks ago because they're rebuilding the bridge over the Saxons River that connects Bellows Falls and Saxons River. But now they've discovered that the bridge is so deteriorated that they've had to put that on hold 
to work out a new plan. So the bridge is now open again, but only briefly. And during that time, Martha Rowley managed to run over from Saxons River and drop a check off on our porch. And we thank you, Miss Martha Rowley. We thank you. <coughs> and out there, out there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he's keeping a close watch on his good friend John Fetterman and making sure that Mr. Fetterman is well enough to go on the attack against Mamet Oz for Senate in Pennsylvania. Oh, out there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, if it were not for my very, very, very tall cousin, Mr. Nat Hunter and his wonderful wife, Elise, we would be lost, ladies and gentlemen. We would be lost. Thank you, Nat. Thank you, Elise. And thank you all for being here tonight. Oh my goodness, what shall we read? What shall we read? I think it's I think the social life of the newt is <laughs> how can you go wrong with the social life of the newt? Let's let's do the social life of the newt. Are we okay with that, ladies and gentlemen? The Social Life of the Newt by Mr. Robert Benchley. And let us hail Mr. Benchley. A hundred years since he wrote these things, we're still reading them, and he's got a commemorative mug. If only I can do so well, ladies and gentlemen. If only I can do so well. It is not generally known that the Newt Although one of the smallest of our North American animals has an extremely happy home life. It is just one of those facts which never get brooded about. I first became interested in the social phenomena of new life early, <laughs> early in the spring of 1913. Shortly after I had finished my research in sexual differentiation amongst amoeba. Since that time, I practically lived among newts, jotting down observations, making lantern slides, watching them in their work and in their play. And you may rest assured that the little rogues have their play, as who does not? Until from left, much lying on my stomach in a research posture over the enclosure in which they were confined, I have found myself developing what I fear may be rudimentary creepers. And so late this autumn, I stood erect and I walked into my house where I immediately set about the compilation of the notes that I have made. So much for the non-technical information. The remainder of this article, <laughs> the remainder of this article bids fair to be fairly scientific. In studying the more intimate phases of newt life, one is chiefly impressed with the methods by which means of which the males force their attention upon the females with matrimony as the object. For the newt is, after all, only a newt, and has his weaknesses, just as any of the rest of us do. And I, for one, would not have it different. There is little enough fun in the world as it is. The peculiar thing about the newt's courtship is its restraint. It is carried on at all times with a minimum distance of 50 paces, newt measure, between the male and the female. Some of the bolder males may now and then attempt to overstep the bounds of good sportsmanship and crowd in to 45 paces, but such tactics are frowned upon by the new rules committee. To the eye of an uninitiated observer, the pair might be dancing a few of the more, more open figures of the minuet. The means employed by the males to draw the attention and win the affection of those of the opposite sex, that is, the females, are varied and, extreme, and extremely strategic. Until the valuable research by Strudelhoff in 1887 is 
Ein Winkel Gemischen mit Michael Haschnick. No one had been able to ascertain just what it was that the male newt did to make the female see anything in him worth throwing herself away on. It had been observed that the most personally unattractive newt could advance to within 50 paces of the female of his acquaintance and, by some coup d'oeil, bring her to a point where she would, in no uncertain terms, indicate her willingness to go through with this marriage ceremony at an early date. It was Strudelhoff who discovered, after watching several thousand courting newts under a magnifying lens, questionable taste on his part, without doubt, but all is fair in pathological love, that the male during the courting season, the season opens on the 10th of March and extends through the following February, leaving about 10 days for general overhauling and redecorating. The male gives forth a strange phosphorescent glow from the center of his highly colored dorsal crest, somewhat similar in effect to the flash of a diamond stick pin in a red necklace. This glow, according to Strudelhoff, so fascinates the female with its air of elegance and indication of wealth that she immediately falls victim to its lure. But the little creature, true to her sex instinct, does not at once give evidence that her morale has been shattered. She affects a coyness and a lack of interest by hitching herself sideways along the bottom of the aquarium with her head turned over her right shoulder away from the swing. A trained ear might even detect her whistling in an indifferent manner. The male, in the meantime, is flashing his gleamer frantically two blocks away and is performing all sorts of attractive feats calculated to bring the lady newt to terms. I have seen a male in the stress of his handicapped courtship Stand on his forefeet, gesticulating in amorous fashion with his hind feet in the air. Franz Engelhardt, in his Uber Weltschmerz de Nut, recounts having observed a distinct and deliberate undulation of the body, beginning with the shoulders and ending at the filament of the tail, which might well have been the origin of what is known today in scientific circles as the shimmy. The object seems to be the same, except that in the case of the newt, it is the male who is the active agent. In order to test the power of observation in the male during these maneuvers, I carefully removed the female for whose benefit he was undulating and put in her place in slow succession another but less charming female. <laughs> A paperweight of bronze shaped like a newt, and finally, a common rubber eraser. From the distance at which the courtship was being carried on, the male, who was, it must be admitted, a bit nearsighted congenitally, was unable to detect the change in personnel and continued, even in the presence of the rubber eraser, to gyrate and undulate in a most conscientious manner until still under the impression that he was making some sort of conquest. At last, worn out by his exertions and disgusted at the meagerness of the reaction, and disgusted at the meagerness of the reaction of the rubber eraser, he gave a low cry of rage and despair and staggered to a nearby pan containing barley water from which he proceeded to drink himself into a gross stupor. Thus, little creature, did your romance end, and who shall say that its ending was one whit less tragic than that of Camille? Not I, not I, for one. In fact, the two cases are not at all analogous. And now, now that we have seen how wonderfully nature works in the fulfillment of her laws, even amongst her tiniest creatures, let us study for a minute a cross-section of the community life of the newt. It is a life full of all kinds of exciting adventure, 
from weaving nests to crawling about in the sun and catching insect larvae and crustaceans. The newt's day is practically never done, largely because the insect larvae multiply three million times as The newt's day is practically <laughs> the newt's day is practically never done, largely because the insect larvae multiply three million times as fast as the newt can possibly catch and eat them. And it takes the closest kind of community teamwork in the newt colony to get things anywhere near cleaned up by nightfall. It is early morning. And the workers are just appearing, and the workers are just appearing, hurrying to the old log, which is to be the scene of their labors. What a scampering! What a bustle! Oh, little scamperers, little bustlers, how lucky you are, and how wise. You work long hours without pay for the sheer love of working an ideal existence, I will tell the scientific world. Over here on the right of the log are the master draggers. Of all the newt workers, they are the most futile, which is high praise indeed. Come, let us look closer and see what it is that they are doing. The one in the lead is dragging a bit of gurry out from the water and up over the edge of the sun and up over the edge into the sunlight. Following him in single file come the rest of the master draggers. They're not dragging anything, but they're sort of helping the leader by crowding against him and eating little pieces out of the filament of his tail. And now they have reached the top. The leader, by dint of much legwork, has succeeded in dragging his prize to the ridge of the log. The little workers, reaching the goal with their precious freight, are now giving it over to the master pushers, who have been waiting for them in the sun all this while. The master pushers' work is soon accomplished, for it consists simply in pushing the piece of gurry over the other side of the log until it falls with the splash into the water and is lost. This part of the day's task finished, the tiny toilers rest, clustered together in a group, waving their heads about from side to side as who should say, there, that is done. And so it is done, my little master draggers and my little master pushers, and well done too. Would that my own work were as clean cut and as satisfying. And so it goes, day in, day out, the busy army of newts go on making the world a better place in which to live. They have their little trials and tragedies, it is true, but they also have their fun, as anyone can tell by looking at a log full of sleeping newts on a hot summer's day. And after all, what more, what more does life have to offer? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us tonight. This will be the only, the only Benchley night in July, but we'll be back in August. Betty Sue will be here with me for pretty much the whole month. She does have a Philadelphia Folk Festival uh, late in August. But uh, we're basically around for August. Then we go off for September. And then we're back. And then uh, who knows? But anyway, we will see you soon. You take good care. You try to forestall fascism. Uh, and we will see you soon. Okay? Thanks again. Bye-bye.